today I'd like to talk about um, uh, a very interesting subject you know, that I discovered a couple of years ago. And uh, before I do that, I want to talk very briefly about myself. So does the clicker work? No, it doesn't. Okay, so let's talk briefly about um, a company I started a couple of years ago, you know, the Hyperganic Group, you know, today is in three locations. Uh, it's in Germany, where we started. I'm German. We have a growing presence in Singapore, and we have a presence in China. You know, we are still a small company. We are about 50 people now, you know, but we tripled the company in the last eight months and plan to triple again by the end of next year. Um, before I talk about what we actually do, I want to briefly introduce myself. My name is Lynn Kaiser. You know, I've been an entrepreneur for 30 years. You know, 40 years ago, I started uh, working with computers. You know, uh, it was a really, really long time ago. Computers looked a little bit different. I will talk a little bit about uh, you know, why that is important. Uh, then in the 1990s, I... Um, uh, worked in a startup that uh, wanted to revolutionize how we deal with industrial machines by using PCs as control systems for industrial machines. Everybody thought we were completely nuts because, of course, you needed specialized hardware and specialized control systems for these industrial machines, except that we did it. And then, of course, you know, today every control system for industrial machines is, is basically a PC. Now, that was very interesting, you know, again, beginning of the 1990s. And in 2000, I did something completely different. I um, helped uh, digitize Hollywood. So I started a company named Eridas, and, um, you know, I stumbled into this field of digital movies, which was beginning at the beginning of 2000s. And um, I, um, I, yeah, I basically built high-speed image processing systems. You know, one of the movies that we helped digitize was was the Matrix. You know, we built the first cinema, digital cinema in the world with our technology and then you know, did high-speed image processing for, for Hollywood. If you've been to the movie in the in movies in the last years, I can guarantee it went through our technology at some point. Now, in um, 2011, I sold that company to Adobe. They wanted to do Photoshop for video. And I said, well, basically, that's what we have. And, um, you know, and then I stayed three years at Adobe. Why did I sell the company? First of all, I think we were done. I mean, when we started, everything was uh, shot on film and everything was projected on film. And, uh, you know, when I sold the company, everything was digital. Everything, everybody had digital cameras, everybody had digital post-processing, everybody had digital projection. But there was something else, you know. I, um, I watched um, Al Gore's TED Talk. You know, he gave a talk in 2000 and it was published by TED in 2008 where he talked uh, about an inconvenient truth and uh, you know, that alerted me to the climate crisis. And of course, today we talk a lot about these things, but then basically nobody knew. I didn't know about it. I thought you know, we had solved the environmental uh, crisis by, um, by uh, separating our trash. You know, apparently there was more to it. So I, um, I think humanity has a lot of challenges ahead. And, um, yeah, we uh, to solve it, and that got me thinking a little bit about um, how far we've actually come. You know, like I said, I started coding when I was eight years old. You know, forty years ago, and um, I witnessed the entire computing revolution. I saw what happened in information technology over the course of forty years. And it's breathtaking, right? I mean, you would never use a computer from 40 years ago, you know? Would you drive a car uh, from 40 years ago? Oh, of course, a lot of people do that. You know? It's not that different. Maybe some of you don't know how to use a stick shift, but you know, that's about it. And there were automatic cars you know, then as well. So a car from the 1980s is a fine car. You know? So why hasn't it evolved as much as information technology? Actually, if you look at most things out there that has, have evolved in the last couple of years, 
they have probably evolved because of information te technology. If you look at a modern car, you know, a lot of the stuff that looks modern is actually displays and computing and these kinds of things. So that kind of started frustrating me a little bit because we've seen all these ideas, you know, from way, way back. I mean, this is a flying car from the 1950s. I mean, that, that was an actual working flying car. You know, we're still not there yet. Well, they were there before. And, uh, you know, there's a funny part of my personal family history. Uh, and it is that uh, my uncle uh, Lutz Kaiser actually started the first private rocket comp in the 1970s and um, actually had um, leased a, a launch pad in, in Africa, you know, back then Zaire, today Congo. Um, it was as big as, um, as Austria. So um, I assumed that by the time I grow up, um, we would be flying into space and be doing all these things. So um, obviously this didn't happen. You know, this is, uh, these are visions of space stations for more than 10,000 people from the 1970s. You know, this didn't, didn't happen. And I started to ask myself, why? And the answer is, it's a fundamental failure in our engineering paradigm. If you think about engineering today, you know, engineering is incredibly slow and laborious. Engineering only scales with the amount of work you put into it. You know, if you want to be successful as an engineering company, you have to hire lots of engineers. And the more engineers you hire and the more skilled and trained they are, the more they actually output. Contrast that with information technology where you invent something once and then everybody can use it. And nobody has to know how it exactly works. You know, as long as you know, it works, you, know, you can move on to the next thing and um, invent something new. And I want to give you a really spectacular example of how incredibly conservative and backwards engineering is. So you probably all heard about you know, terrible crashes of the Boeing 737 MAX, you know, that happened a couple of years ago. And many of, I mean, we, we heard all kinds of stories about why this happened. I mean, you know, some of you know the details, you know, so there was like a malfunctioning sensor and there was some mechanism in the software of the plane that the pilots didn't know about, and then, you know, the whole thing crashed. But the question is, why was all this stuff there in the first place? Now, when they did the 737 MAX, they put very advanced um, aircraft engines underneath the wing. And modern aircraft engines are way bigger than the, they were in the you know, early beginnings of uh, the jet age. So because these engines didn't really fit under the wing, they had to move them forward and up. So they actually protrude, protrude over the wing. Now, if you do that, your airplane wants to go up because, well, it's forward and up, right? And so that's what airplanes do when they are aerodynamically unstable. And so they built this really elaborate mechanism that actually, um, when this happens, I mean, when, when an airplane get, goes too much up, you know, it fall, starts falling out of the sky, it stalls, right? You know, so they created this really elaborate software that detected whether it was about to stall and then, you know, try to counteract that. Now, unfortunately, you know, it put on one sensor and that sensor malfunctioned. And so this thing went into a nosedive and didn't know what to do. And so it crashed. But you could ask yourself, why? Why is the wing of the aircraft so low on the ground that the, you know, the, um, the engines don't fit under it? And it is because the 737 MAX is a direct descendant of the 707 from the 1950s. And as you can see, I mean, the, the aircraft engines in the 1950s, they're way, way smaller than what they are today. Now, <clears throat> Why um, is the aircraft so low to the ground? Well, <laughs> because back then uh, they didn't have proper airports. And when they wanted to move the luggage into the aircraft, it was really convenient if you could just move it in there. So today, still, you can move the luggage in um, pretty easily 
in, uh, in a 737 MAX of the latest generation, but the uh, engine doesn't fit under the wing anymore. And so that's a problem. Yeah? So you can see here very well, you know, that fit under it. And now, if you look carefully at the modern plane, you know, it doesn't fit anymore. You know, it's way too big. You know, it needs to be forward and up. And this is why the airplane is aerodynamically unstable. Now, think about it. Think about it. They felt it was easier to build a really com basically a, you know, that's a hack. You know, they have an aerodynamically unstable plane and they hacked it so it doesn't fall out of the sky. So they felt this is an easier solution than actually redesigning the landing gear to move the airplane higher up from the ground so that the, air, uh, the airplane engine actually fits. Now, why does, doesn't Airbus have that problem? Well, Airbus were introduced in the 1980s. We had proper airports by then. We had gangways. We had you know, uh, devices that moved luggage into the airplanes, no problem. So all Airbus planes are way higher up ground. They don't have a problem to fit a modern air engine under it. You know, the 787 and 777, et cetera, also don't have the problem because they are newer pro airplanes. But here you can see, isn't that insane? You know, that engineering works so slowly that we are recycling an airplane designed from the 1950s all over again. And even if there's a compelling reason to change it, we don't do it because it's too much work. Now, a lot of the challenges that we have ahead of us are engineering challenges. And, you know, uh, Christina, uh, Christiana Figueres, you know, the architect of the Paris Agreement, she's very, very hopeful that by Industry 4.0, et cetera, we are going to actually help change the climate crisis and, and solve the climate crisis. Now, the problem is, I think she's way too optimistic unless we actually come up with a completely new engineering paradigm. And that's really what we, you know, when um, we come up with Hyperganic. So what do we do at Hyperganic? We want to dramatically accelerate innovation in the engineering of physical objects to help solve humanity's greatest challenges. And what do we actually do? we move engineering to a software paradigm. In software, you create algorithms. In software, you don't do things manually. In software, you do things once, and then you never do it again. So what we do is we create physical objects through computer code and artificial intelligence. Now, because it's an algorithm, you can trade this digitally, and then we produce them usually additively uh, in digital factories. So what we do is we take this laborious human-driven engineering process, and Josephine is going to talk about this a little bit more you know, in just a second, um, and we put the thought process of an engineer into a computer algorithm. And now the computer can actually build things on its own. And that is going to hopefully enable this industrial revolution Christiana Figueres talked about, because most people think about, you know, the 3D printing aspect, you know, and all of these things, but they always forget about engineering. And 3D printing, industrial 3D printing, is a key component of that. I don't know how many of you here are familiar with it. Now, when I discovered 3D printing in 2012, I thought about, yeah, the maker bots and these kinds of things, you know, printing little plastics, parts, etc. And then I actually dove deeper, and then I realized you know, how far we've actually already come in the last 35 years in 3D printing, that we can produce objects from almost any material, whether it's ceramics, glass, metals, you know, living cells, etc. And uh, we can produce almost anything. The, 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 the sad thing is we don't because it almost never makes sense because we've been trying to produce the things that you can also produce in another way. And, you know, why would you then 3D print it? It's usually slower, you know, it has more complications, etc. And so I think it's very, very important to realize, you know, how far we've come on the production side, but how 
little progress we've actually made on the engineering side. You know, on the engineering side, you know, we still use humans through a really boring and, and laborious process to actually design things that are not very complex and not very sophisticated, simply because we constantly run out of time. And so what we are doing is we're moving this to a software paradigm. And maybe it takes, I mean, I've been coding all my life. You know, I stopped coding years ago, but, you know, I've learned how to code when I was eight years old. And by the way, coding isn't hard because I learned it when I was eight years old, right? You know, so, you know, most people think that writing computer code is a complicated thing. It's not, you know, it's, it's logic. It's, it's fairly simple. And once you have the right approach to it, you know, people always make these things complicated. But we move engineering to the software paradigm and we hope to actually move Moore's law into the speed of engineering. So Moore's law is this law where you know, we basically have this exponential curve and we've all seen this happen in information technology. I mean, think about it. Everybody here holds a mobile phone, you know, smartphone in their hands. You know, 12 years ago, they didn't exist. I mean, that's only a decade. 20 years ago, maybe some of you used the internet, but a few of you didn't use it because it was this newfangled thing that nobody know, knew what to do with. 30 years ago, very few of you had PCs. You know, now, now everybody, at least one, you know, usually a few. You know, Bill Gates' vision for Microsoft in the 1980s was you know, a computer in every home. People laughed at him and said, this is ridiculous. You know, why, why, why would I use a computer in my home now? Now people look at it and say, what's just one computer in a home? It's ridiculous. What kind of home is that? So um, in IT, we've come a really far way. But as Josephine is going to tell you in a second, um, you know, in uh, engineering, we haven't. And now we can. And so I want to pass this over to uh, my colleague and, colleague and partner, Josephine, who is going to tell you how we build really amazing machines using computer code. And then afterwards, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what this hopefully will mean in the next couple of decades. So thank you, and over to you. Thank you. So I wanna illustrate what Lynn just said more from a practical point of view. Um, my name is Josephine, I am an engineer. I tried to do some interesting things because I grew up with a very romantic view of engineering. I thought these are the guys who invent the coolest stuff and come up with uh, new designs and innovation. Um, so I studied aerospace engineering in Germany. And during that time, I worked in the Formula One team for Mercedes, um, got involved with building the world championship winning car for that year. Uh, and then my bachelor thesis uh, worked in the semiconductor industry with Infineon. I built um, multicopter monster drones to carry around people. Um, then I went back to do my master's. Uh, during that time, I joined the new Formula E team for Porsche, and I worked as a race engineer. So I would predict how the battery usage runs and uh, how much energy is left during the race and come up with a according strategy. Um, I joined some cool simulation sessions. You can see some pictures there. Um, and then lately I got into space technology and I participated in an um, astronaut training at the uh, Astronaut Training Center in Cologne for ESA. So that was really cool. Um, what you also realize when you do all these different engineering fields is that engineering is a very manual and laborious work and uh, changes quite slowly. So when I came across Hypergenic, I was very intrigued by the idea that moving a software paradigm to engineering supercharges your engineering power in a way. Because um, I want to talk about the limitations of traditional engineering and how I learned it to be. First of all, um, in traditional engineering, your output is limited by the human imagination and hours of work that you put into a project. And it's also limited with the available tools. So I boldly put together this slide, which illustrates that basically our engineering tools haven't evolved much um, since Leonardo da Vinci draw with pen and paper. 
Um, today we use CAD programs, so computer-aided design tools, but basically you just, um, you just you still draw on screen. And you can imagine that it's really hard to come up with a highly complex 3D um, design. You only have a flat sheet of paper to draw it onto. So um, even if you have the ima imagination of a very interesting object, you need a tool to kind of express your thoughts. So that's the first thing. Um, CAD tools are not automated in any way. So the amount of engineering output that you gain scales linearly with the amount of time the engineer spends in front of the computer screen. And the occasional <laughs> engineer wants to, uh, wants to eat, sleep, and uh, might want to go to the toilet and leave after eight hours of work. So um, that's a problem in scale. If you want to scale your engineering power, you want to move to a software-based approach. Um, so the moving a software-based approach uh, and combining it with the art of producing an object is what we call algorithmic engineering. And an algorithmic engineer scales with the amount of computational power that you deploy to a problem. So I don't waste my time drawing um, one product on screen. Instead, I think of it on a higher level and I come up with rules that describe the process of how I would design such an object. And then I let the computer do it, obviously, and, um, and run this on my laptop and also run it on a cloud cluster if I need more computational power. And again, once I encapsulated my knowledge into algorithms, then I can easily give this algorithm to another engineer and he can use it. So it scales uh, much, much more efficiently. And this I find very intriguing as an engineer. Now, how does it work? Um, you try to encapsulate your, your function of how you want to construct an object into algorithms. Um, these algorithms obviously need to be fed by an input, um, which can be a set of parameters uh, where you define your constraints of the problem or um, you define ranges for parameters. Um, you let the algorithm test these inputs and output is um, one of these objects, for example. And once you have this algorithm, you can almost treat it as a black box. And when you feed in different input parameters, then a different output is generated. And in even more detail, you see this here for one of our heat exchanger designs. Um, and you see that this is a very linear process of a step-by-step -step algorithm recipe of how to cook a geometry. And um, if you use an, uh, a computer to design objects, then, well, the computer doesn't get tired. So you can uh, deploy rules that say, okay, for a thousand times you execute this rule or for a hundred times you do this. And the result is that you can come up with very intricate and very complex geometries that you would not be able to design manually. Uh, when you look at these things uh, in computer code, they're actually quite simple. But if you were tasked to draw this manually in 3D in the CAD program, you would say, oh, please don't do that to me. And if I ask you to change some of the uh, criteria, um, you would not want to do that. There is one more aspect to scale. So the first one, as I said, was that you can deploy more uh, computational power to scale. The other one is that when you use algorithms, you try to solve problems on a more abstract level. Um, so when you do this uh, in a smart way, then you to solve the problem as abstract as possible. And that then allows you to deploy the algorithm to different domains. So um, this is an example of a lattice fill where we um, repeat little structures within a geometry um, to make up its porosity or um, its material. And if you do this in a smart way, then you can deploy this for insoles as well as for bone structures, for example. And this is, again, very interesting for me as an engineer because I always saw myself as a generalist. And now I start to see um, the possibility to connect these different domains and to play, have a play in all of them. Before, as the engineer, you, you tend to specialize in one field, and then that's all you get to see. While I work on all these things during one day, and it's on a more abstract level, they, they, you see the similarities, which is very interesting. So now I want to show you two of my um, projects that I've been involved lately. The first one, the Alveoli project, which I did with a tissue institute from Munich together with a PhD student. And um, she was trying to print um, alveoli, so lung tissue, with a nanoscribe 3D printer. So there was a um, 3D printer that can output 
or print living cells and she will replicate this tissue. Now, the problem was that she had the CT scan of a mouse and she would successfully print it. But it was always this one CT scan. She couldn't actually bury it. So she was just doing her studies on one, always on the same uh, geometry. And she wanted to with a parametric model so that she could actually um, vary some of the geometry features and then methodically study it. And I helped her with that. So um, I came up with a um, parametric model for an alveoli using our hypergenic software. And um, this is an image from her PhD thesis. We would um, parametrize different design features. So, for example, the bubbly base surface, how much um, how much bubbles you have in one volume. Um, we would parametrize how intricate the vascular system is that grows on top of these um, assays, and we we were able to change the waters. Oh, and actually, that reminds me, we have one printed example here. So this is 5,000 times larger than the original one. So when she printed on the nanoscribe printer, um, it was a third of a millimeter. And I do have some images of the, yeah, you can, you can show that. <laughs> so here you have the original print under a microscope. And for me, so, she was very excited when she came to our office and she showed us this Petri dish with the three little white dots. And when you look at them under the microscope, you actually see the full amount of detail. So this is the object that we are passing around, just uh, printed on this nanoscribe printer. And for me, it was quite astonishing to see how much detail you can print on such a small scale. Another one. Um, and again, I think this is key for the up for the, for the upcoming of bioengineering, because um, with algorithmic design tools for the first time, they are in a position where they can actually model geometries that are as complex as the natural objects that they wanna study, but they are not limited anymore to the existing geometries. They can actively modify it and then study um, methodically what is the influence of the wall thickness, what is the influence of porosity, uh, what is the influence of whatnot of the vascular system. And this will boost our understanding in that field. On my side, I'm very intrigued and wanted to figure out what else I can do with uh, our design platform. So I had to go at um, bone structures, some algorithms that mimic the um, capillary growth on top of surfaces. Um, I simulated some cell growth over here and I tried to come up with a fully parametric model of a lung which was kind of to me because um, eventually I realized that in my computer code, um, I had a parameter set two, which uh, defined the number of uh, lobes in your lung. So in nature, we have two lobes on our lung, right? And I was like, oh, I could just change the parameter because it's just a parameter. So I set it to five and I generated a lung with five lobes, which was kind of interesting, but it shows you how much you can, you can do and build up. Um, and again, you can model these very complex structures um, very well using computer algorithms because you can simulate cell growth and you can overlay some kind of artificial randomness to it um, so that they look like organic objects because uh, in organic objects you have a bit of variance on the microscopic scale but then these kind of variances um, dictate the macroscopic properties of a material and we can mimic this with our design approach. Now switching domains this is the second I want to talk to you. Um, it's an aerospike rocket engine. I told you I got in, um, interested in space technology. So I wanted to build the most advanced rocket and ever been designed. And I want to do it fully uh, algorithmically. Um, the idea behind the aerospike rocket engine is that, um, so it's a concept that's been around since the 60s, 70s. And it promised a significant performance gain over existing rocket engines. Now it was never been able to, or it was never successfully realized because it's just really complex to cool that thing down and it's very um, compactly packed. So it's, it poses some engineering challenges that in the, could never been overcome. 
Now, my hypothesis was that with 3D printing and this algorithmic design approach, we could actually solve these problems and now um, blend it arrow spike uh, engine design. So what I then do is I would think of this assembly and figure out what kind of parts and components make up this rocket engine. So for example, you need combustion chambers, you need cooling circuit, you need the central spike, you need the flange and so on. And similarly to the physical um, structure of the object, I would build up my software structure. So I would define classes and software modules for each part on the rocket engine. And I would then let these software modules talk to each other that the, the information between uh, of the geometry can flow amongst all of these components. And the very powerful thing that you can do once you have encapsulated all your engineering knowledge into these software modules is you can press the button and let the computer do the work. And this is one image of many, many rocket variations that, um, that I ran over one weekend. So it took me a couple of months to run the computer code because you need to encode, well, all the rocket equations and whatnot. But once you've done that, um, each of these engines took 10 minutes to generate. And each of them is slightly different. So they, um, they obey the same rules of construction, but the algorithms were fed with different input parameters. So for example, I say, how high can the rocket engine be? What's the spike angle? What kind of Mach number and so on? Um, and every time the result looks slightly different. So I can come up with a hundred variants um, automatically over a weekend. And what we've done, what we did then is we actually printed one of the designs on an EOS machine from Inconel. And uh, this, was, this was quite recently. And I was really excited about this because um, such a complex rocket engine has never been printed before. And even the print specialists were quite that it actually worked. And um, we're gonna go further with the development, but uh, one of the biggest benefits that we can bring is that we can generate this very intricate cooling structure. So this is one combustion chamber here. Here's another one. And we can route these cooling channels automatically. And also this, and um, this is where the performance gain lies. If you can cool your rocket engine um, sufficiently, then you can output more power. So this is a big, and it's beautiful to look at as well. Anyway, um, I showed this slide before where we had the input, the function or the algorithm and the output. Now, um, and I showed you how I can randomly generate rocket variants. Now um, you wanna design the best or you wanna find the best out of these variants. How do you do this? You introduce a feedback loop. So you generate a hundred variants in the first go, and then you need to come up with an objective function that tests which of those actually make sense. And then whatever you learn from this first batch, you can feed back into how you choose the input parameters for your second iteration. And then you can close your loop. Um, for the example of a rocket engine, you can have different methods of feeding back the data. So for example, you could use analytical formulas to um, just check on whether certain conditions are fulfilled in your, uh, in your output geometry. The other one obviously would be that you simulate the whole thing and you test, oh, does the temperature get too hot? Is the stress too high in certain places? If that's the case, then you need to come up with a rule what you wanna do. So you wanna thicken the wall, for example, in certain spots, depending on where it got too hot or where uh, the stress was too high. Or another very interesting one is that you can just test fire it. And that applies to many 3D printed objects. Um, the printing part is automated. The engineering part is automated. So you might as well just print a couple of ones and test them because that's the best feedback. You can get feedback from reality. And this becomes now more variable because generating a new um, design takes 10 minutes. Um, and in traditional engineering, you wouldn't wanna do this because it would take you a couple of months to come up with a new design. So um, with this approach, you can actually be more creative and bold in how you explore the solution space because it doesn't cost you any time. At engineering school, we were taught to play it conservatively because it should work the first or the second try. Otherwise you've wasted too much money and too much time. So you try to scare away from trying innovative stuff. And I showed a similar slide before where I taught about the power of abstraction um, actually, I did a similar thing for the two 
projects that I just showed, and they came from very different domains. So one was in the bioengineering field, the other one was rocketry. But um, for the rocket engine, I designed an algorithm that would automatically route the cooling channels across the surface of combustion chamber. Um, now, when I did the alveoli project, I was actually able to take one of those algorithms and directly to the alveoli, because I have um, the general problem of routing some kind of tubes across the surface on some generic other surface. Um, so that was a revealing moment to see that from a rocket engine, you can take an algorithm and deploy it to an alveoli. Of course, the rules of how these tubes grow was slightly different. For the rocket engine, there were really strict rules of how the temperature needs to change and whatnot. Um, for the alveoli, I just said, okay, you can branch randomly and you can you can wiggle randomly and so on, but it's the same algorithm. And um, because of that, it actually just took me four hours to, uh, to design alveoli, while it took me a couple of months to design the, the aerospike engine. So you can see that once we're in a position to build up all these software components, um, the design process will also speed up in itself. And that's everything from my side. I just leave this slide because it's, it's, uh, it gives a nice view into the future and makes you think about all the exciting objects that we can build with that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think I want to um, quickly emphasize a couple of points that Josephine made, you know, so first of all, as an engineer, you're trying to play things safe. Why? Because, you know, you're probably going to need a couple of weak months, you know, to build something. Now, if the whole thing doesn't work, you have to start from scratch again. I mean, there's only so many times your boss will accept you doing that, you know, until he fires you. So you better get it right the first time, then maybe you iterate a little bit, and then hopefully it works. Now, we all know SpaceX, for example. You know, they are a very, very innovative company, but actually their rocket designs are fairly conservative. Why? Because they want to be very fast. You know, they want to you know, get out very fast. You know, a lot of their rocket designs, you know, date back to the 1950s from the Russians, you know, their concept of using massive amounts of engines and stuff, stuff like that. That's a not, not a new concept. So in engineering, you can either do be innovative and then you're super slow, or you can be conservative and then, well, you get the stuff out relatively fast. You know? So you know, it's a really tough decision. Now, if you encapsulate your knowledge about how to build things into computer algorithms and then move that to the speed of computers, you don't have to make that compromise. And as Josephine has shown, you know, we can now generate a completely different variant of a super complex machine within minutes. That means I can find the optimal object out of a vast solution space. I don't have to you know, do something that's highly over-engineered and hopefully works for the first go. So you can get way closer to the actual optimum. And that is the key to innovation, yeah? The other thing I want to talk about is, you know, why computer code? I mean, couldn't we do some kind of, you know, visual thing or whatever, you know, people have been programming with these kinds of things. This works great for simple stuff. I mean, we have a couple of simple things. So this is a, a bicycle helmet. You can define something like that, you know, using a visual programming language or something like that. That's a heat exchanger, you know, for microchips. But have fun doing something like that in a visual language, you know, drawing stuff on screen and connecting, you know, wires. I mean, let alone, you know, this here. And by the way, I mean, later you can look at this, you know, a little bit hesitant to pass it around um, because a little bit fragile, that's not the metal one. So my kids learn how to code, you know, in programming languages like that. But frankly, I mean, this is not how you build software. You know, you build software using computer code. We're talking about, about large scale software development here. We will build the most complex machines that were ever designed using computer code. And that's not gonna be a simple task. But I always ask myself, you know, why do we have 
software that can fly airplanes, but we don't have software that can design airplanes. Now, if you think about it, flying an airplane is actually a more complex undertaking than, than designing an airplane, because designing an airplane might, might be a lot of work, but it's very clear, you know, you start with this step and that step, and, you know, you can iteratively, you know, with a lot of work, get to, you know, where an engineer would get, you know, when they design something. So we're talking about large-scale software development. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is the factories of the future. Most people associate 3D printing with, you know, small printers and, and things like that. I mean, we've all seen the maker bots, you know, and these kinds of things. You know, a couple of years ago, people thought that is the factory of the future. Today, most people think this is a factory of the future. But there's one really weird thing, factory of the future. I mean, you see this guy here? He doesn't belong there. You know, if you go to a BMW factory, there's not a guy standing around. There's lots of robots, you know, building stuff. So the factories of the future are going to be highly complex. You know, if you want to use a model, I mean, look at, you know, something like that. That's a Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation factory. You know, they build microchips. You know, chip fabs are the most complex factories in the world. You know, they cost billions and billions of uh, dollars, you know, to build and they produce um, amazing objects through a really complex process. This is the model that we are going to see uh, for the factories of the future. Now, there is going to be a lot of, you know, these distributed things, et cetera, and small scale things, but uh, let there be no mistake about it. You know, the factories of the future are going to require massive investments and they are going to be really complex objects. Yeah, they're not going to be a little printer in everybody's home. By the way, one of the guys who completely get it, gets it is a man named Hermann Hauser. He's one of our investors. Hermann uh, built a company called Acorn Computing in the 1970s. You know, uh, nobody knows them anymore. You know, they built amongst them one, one of the first PCs, you know, the BBC Micro, for example. Um, but they also built a new processing architecture. They called it the ACORN RISC machine. Not RISC because it was risky, but because RISC stood for reduced instruction set computing, a very special way of, of doing uh, microprocessors. And that company, the ACORN RISC machine, short ARM, you know, they spun out as a processor company. Now, the interesting thing is that ARM doesn't build any processors. ARM actually licenses their software that actually designs processors to companies like Apple, and they actually build their own processors using the intellectual property of ARM and their own to get you know, to something like the M1 chip that is in this computer here. Now, once they're done with the design, they actually go to another entity, and that's, you know, in this case, TSMC, you know, but there are others, uh, to actually produce their chips. And that's actually where I see engineering going. You, know? you are going to use platform and intellectual properties that, that other people have developed on our platform and your own intellectual property to design objects that are highly specific to your industry and to your uh, intellectual property. And then you're going to go to a manufacturing partner that is going to produce this object for you. And this manufacturing partner today may have a relatively simple boutique-like factory, but in 10 years from now, they are going to be really, really complex. And at some point, we are going to be able to print a laptop or a, an airplane. Boeing CEO already four or five years ago said, you know, his goal is to 3D print entire aircraft. Yeah? And uh, if you think about, you know, how far an object like that is away from traditional engineering, you can imagine what the airplanes of the future can look like. There's one interesting aspect about um, this new world, and that's the future of trade. You know, I mean, what, what does trade look like? I mean, right now, trade is an interesting thing, you know, because, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's physical trade, right? You know, I mean, there is also digital trade. I mean, we sell software and the, these kinds of things, right? Uh, we sell music. Music used to be physical. I mean, you ship CDs around, and now, of course, nobody does that anymore. So today, I mean, basically, a factory is a gigantic logistic hub, 
big day, you know, you have lots of stuff going in and then it's assembled and then it goes out and then it's stored in warehouses and at some point, you know, people can buy it. Now, if you think about um, this, these digital physical products that we're talking about, where you could trade things for a long time digitally and then at the last mile, you actually use them close to the consumer, it's going to disrupt a lot of businesses. And we see that. I mean, we do a lot of work in consumer products, for example, and in more products. I mean, they're actually pretty energy intensive and it's, uh, there's a lot of waste and, you know, a lot of shipping back and forth around the globe. And uh, yeah, well, you can, if you move that digital, you, you go into, you go in, you design the thing that you want, and uh, you know, this, this object is then shipped directly to you, and it's produced relatively close to you. And um, you can imagine what this will do. By the way, trade, not just the products, but also kind of the intellectual property. If somebody has a great idea somewhere, why they license it to all the people who want it. In software, we have that all the time. If I design a database, you don't know how to, you don't, you, you can just use it, have to know how to build a database. So, you know, if somebody else there designs a better database, they can just, you can just swap it out, you know, so there is no reason why you know something like that cannot happen in engineering but and you know this brings us back to this region actually you know so i don't think big trade hubs need to fear you know that they're going to go out of business anytime soon although you know i had a conversation with the chief trade um a strategist for the european Con commission and he said we are clearly already at peak trade so he said, from now on, trade will actually go downwards. And that's interesting, right? You know, because you, everybody assumes, you know, it's actually going to continue to go upwards because we have more people, you know, uh, buying more, more things, et cetera. But he says, because of distributed manufacturing methods, et cetera, it's, to him, it's clear that we are already at the peak and then it's going to plateau for a while and it's probably going to go down. However, you know, if you think about what I just said about these highly complicated factories of the future, I mean, these fa factories of the future are not going to be everywhere and close to the consumers. I mean, they will probably be exactly at it hubs. That's from where you can ship these things. And, uh, you know, I just want to close with, um, you know, why here? I mean, I told you earlier, you know, we are Munich, we are in Singapore, we are in China. Why are we in Singapore and China? We see that the governments um, in these countries, you know, are very much aligned with our vision, and they have a plan for where they want to go. Singapore, you know, put into their five-year plan already three years ago that they want to industrialize the country using additive manufacturing. And uh, Singapore has always been very, very strategic about these kinds of things. You know, um, two years after independence of Singapore. National Semiconductor opened their first chip factory in Singapore, and Singapore is still one of the leading um, countries for semiconductor manufacturing. So, you know, they know what they are doing. China obviously knows what they are doing. And we see that, you know, this region here also has a strategy for industrialization, and, um, you know, they're looking for ideas. And um, uh, I think um, we can probably help there a little bit. You know, so we're very, very happy here, and um, you know, we're currently exploring what we can do uh, in this region. You know, we see very well-educated people here. We see um, you know, a hunger for uh, you know a um, uh, uh, for for industrialization. Um, at the same time, there isn't much yet, so this can actually be a huge challenge because you're not fighting against you know, the powers that are already existing and uh, you don't have the lag that you often create when you uh, talk to traditional engineers. So you know, we're very, very hopeful that uh, we can do something here uh, specifically in this region as well. Yeah, um, with that, uh, it's been, been a long talk. I want to briefly open it for some questions if you, if you have any. It was fascinating. Um, uh, anticipable to design uh, the rules as well. 
uh, designing materials? Yeah, so basically yes, of course. any assumptions as to what materials are needed for specific yeah. uh, engineering applications. Now, I mean, there are so many things I haven't talked about yet. You know, I mean, one of the things that nature does, for example, nature builds stuff additively, by the way, interesting, right? You know, so um, and nature builds very complex things. And one of the things that nature does is it actually builds its own materials. You know, if you think about it, um, the base material may be the same, but the material properties are actually different. So if you look at a tree, I mean, it's not so entirely clear, you know, where the trunk ends, you know, and the, the branch starts and, you know, the leaf starts, you know, it's all grows into each other and it's all basically the same material, but very differently structured inside. And you can do things like that in 3D printing, you know. So, for example, our data model, what we use internally, basically stores points in space and every point can have its own material properties, process properties. And so by varying how you print things or what kind of material mixture you use, et cetera, you can design materials by creating tiny, tiny little lattice structures. You can you know, design things in a, in a different way. And so one of the interesting aspects for sustainability is, for example, that you can, I mean, for example, if you look at many consumer products, they're made from many, many different materials. You need different properties in different places, right? Now, if you can vary these properties in the same material by creating different structures or by printing them differently, you can print it all from one material and that makes it much easier to recycle them, for example. But yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, material design is a very, very interesting thing. One of the most interesting areas in that regard is multi-material printing. So imagine you can print with a metal printer that mixes metal on the go, you know, creates gradients between different materials. I mean, going from copper to steel in a gradient. People have never been able to do that. I mean, how would you do that in traditional man manufacturing, right? So um, the material scientists and, and metallurgists, et cetera, they're going to go into overdrive you know, um, uh, on these things. Yeah, very, very interesting field. Yeah. Any more questions? Sam Fakhouri, I'm working for Avaya. I, I just want to uh, comment on your last uh, part, which is very important about Dubai. If you are planning in order to extend, uh, to see the potential for, for, for this region, what is your plan in order to extend your type of agreements to improve talents in Dubai? Yeah. Universities, mm -hmm. and we have several ones, do you have any plans on this? Yes. This is we, the most important, yeah. I would say, uh, investment, mm -hmm. even in your R&D yeah. and the potential to grow and improve what you are doing. No, thank you very much. I mean, so the question is, you know, um, how, what, what can we do to improve the talent, you know, specifically, educate the talent specifically here in Dubai and, and in UAE in general? And um, the same thing that we have to do all over the world, because what we do, nobody has ever done before, so there are no... Uh, you know, courses on and no education in this space, you know. And uh, one of the things, I mean, I said um, earlier that we um, tripled the company in uh, eight months. So we take somebody who did traditional engineering or did traditional software development, and within the course of a month, we make them productive on our platform and educate them to be an algorithmic engineer. So we had to develop our own online coursework, you know, our own curriculum, et cetera. And now we're increasingly bringing it to, um, you know, universities, but also, you know, we teach, um, you know, our customers who develop on our platform. So uh, Josephine, actually, um, just um, uh, two months ago, did the first masterclass at Khalifa University in, in the UAE, where she trained, you know, uh, 20 uh, PhD students plus five professors on the use of our platform and you know how to become an algorithmic engineer. So we specifically want to work with the universities here in the region. We also want to work with clients here in the regions. And you know the other thing that we're going to do is we are probably very soon going to start to hire people here specifically in the region 
and and we have to educate these people as well. But yeah, I mean, education is a really, really important part of our strategy. Now, it's interesting, right? You know, because we are still a relatively small company, but we see that without a groundswell of engineers sitting the universities who know about this new way of doing things, you know, this whole thing will not fly, right? You know, because where do the people come from who can apply this? You know, so we in Singapore and Germany, you know, now here we are starting to educate people and hopefully they will at some point be able to educate other people. You know, that's why we're training professors as well. But yeah, I mean, we're very, very interested in working with educational institutions here in the region. And we are obviously interested in, in hiring talent and then educating them ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Good, maybe one last question if there's any. We have one from the online audience. So I think it's for Josephine. Uh, could algorithmic engineering be creative or it's just equations and limitations? Um, yes, it can be because um, you can give certain variations to the algorithm that you define. So you don't need to play it deterministically in the sense that you tell the computer every little step it needs to take. It, you can tell the algorithm to, um, um, you can tell the goal which, which it should um, achieve with an objective function and then you might be surprised which geometry actually comes out of that. So you can play with many things of how you dis how you define the goal, whether you or how you define the rules, and uh, actually artificial intelligence, uh, uh, reinforcement learning, and all this stuff will play a lot of um, a big role in that. Yeah, and if I may add one thing, um, I always thought writing computer code is one of the most creative things you can do, because you can imagine something and you can build it and now you can print it. So it is, it is actually quite, um, it's, it's a different creative process. Most people think of creativity as something that immediately creates a object. But now you're doing it in a little bit more an indirect way. You're crafting the algorithm that then creates the object. And that is also a creative process. And it has the potential to create things that you would never be able to produce through a manual action, right? I mean, how would you even start designing something like that? But yet it is the output of a creative process that Josephine went through when she built this. Now, there's a lot of formulas in it and logics and rocket science, literally. But let's let there be no mistake about it. It is a creative process. So I think we have to think about creativity also in a little bit of a different way. And um, I think algorithms applied in the right way give people creative superpowers. And they move engineering, but also design onto a completely new level where you interact with it on a much higher level uh, then you could if you have to completely redesign things manually. I mean, a lot of people, let's face it, are not great at designing things manually. I mean, let's take an analogy. Everybody has a smartphone now. Everybody is a good photographer now. Now, even people who were not great photographers before are great photographers now because the phone actually does a lot of the work that actually went into being a good photographer. Now, people can focus on things like framing, you know? I mean, like how to actually look at it. They don't have to focus on, you know, the, the exposure time and, you know, what not, what, what, you know, f-stop, you know, all the things that, you know, I mean, I, I, I used film cameras, you know, right? You know, with film, I mean, you had 24 pictures and they hopefully were good. Now a lot of more people are creative using these tools. 
And I see things like that happening in engineering where people who may not know how to do a rocket, you know, um, may be able to use the algorithm that actually does the rocket, right? And maybe they use it for something completely different because Josie also explained how you can transfer the algorithms from one object to a completely different object. So for example, I see a lot of applications here also in design and art, you know, they have nothing to do with engineering because now you can create objects that, you know, approach the complexity of nature and some of them are going to be very beautiful. I think this is very beautiful. Yeah. And, um, and uh, there's a lot of other things that you can do. And um, yeah, in the end, uh, it's, it's building objects from atoms so by moving atoms in space. And you know, how you move them you know, can be very creative. Yeah, I think um, yeah. that's a good last question, actually. Yeah, I mean, I see, I see this as a huge opportunity to move us to a completely new level. I mean, we've been designing things the same way since the Romans and the Egyptians, basically, you know, and uh, I think it's time we move it to a software paradigm because software has revolutionized our world. And I think it can revolutionize all the things around us, you know, because right now they are fairly simple and um, they're going to be more along the lines of these kinds of things. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I just wanted to thank uh, Lean and Josephine. That was a very interesting uh, session. And also I wanted to thank you for uh, giving your time, for attending and joining us, as well as to those who attended virtually.